Does the end justify the means? Well, you see, that only you can only pose that question. It's like the famous question whether honesty is the best policy. You heard that one? But if honesty has to be a policy, then it's not honesty. It should be natural, you know, natural thing. But any society, any civilization that has a, a maxim that says honesty must be a, the best of policies is, 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 is a devilish, decrepit, immoral society. It shouldn't be a policy. A deliberate sitting down, I shall be honest. You know? <laughs> so, and justifying it means that Shakespeare believes that life is processual. Fundamental reality is process. So the means are as much a reality as the end. They're intertwined. You can't separate them in Aristotelian fashion. Method, result, methodology, ontology, this will produce that. You can't separate them. So it is ridiculous to argue, according to Shakespeare, that whatever you do, you justify the result. And he takes it up in Henry V when we come to it. Because he faces the question, when is war justified? You know, when is physical arms justified? When is that ever justified? And he deals with it in Henry V. And I don't want to advance my lecture to Henry V because a lot of beautiful poetic passages in Henry V and the prologues and the epilogues and the choruses. So that happened. Now, what about the comic characters? Oh, by the way, well, I'll tell you about the famous lines in a minute. Uh, the Falstaff from the first Henry IV, he is now going to fight in Yorkshire. And he's going to pick up men on the way. But being Falstaff, very good poem on the board. Congratulations. And um, Falstaff turns up at the Battle of Galtry late. He turns up when he's John of Lancaster's royal troops are arresting people. And one stupid knight named Sir John Colville, he's escaping and Falstaff captures him. He says, aha, this proves he was in the battle. I want a reward, you know. Now, <coughs> two characters who I would suggest to you, Falstaff and Prospero, I think are the best, in my view, personally, drawn characterizations by Shakespeare. Prosper and Tempest. No, Cal Caliban. Caliban and Post, I thought, were the best drawn characters. He uses him to satirize. Now, this is what Shakespeare does in Henry IV, Part Two. He makes him satirize chivalry, this business of your turn, my turn. You know? You know, the Battle of Agincourt, you know, as many men died as in a minor commando raid in World War II. In the whole battle. In 1346, and I think the play refers to it, this is an earlier battle now, Edward III stood on a hill while all these Frenchmen came to fight the British. And the black prince, the guy was called his son, let him run the army. And they beat up all these Frenchmen while he stood on a hill. And when you exercise, so, so it's total victory, says the Colin Shed, says all the tout and all the. But you check the deaths and captured. It's a, it's a, it's a fantastic situation. A hundred men haven't died yet. <laughs> it was a big battle. But you may say they don't have the scientific engines of mass destruction that the modern age has. You, you could say that. <laughs> but the point I'm making is that. Well, you know the point. <laughs> I, I, I don't think I need to, to stress. Paul Stark turns up, and he's satirizing all this crap, all this chivalry. I want my reward. I captured Sir John Colville. Of course, they don't want to give him his reward. He writes with his friends and the booze, and the whole of the thing now starts to deal with the satirization of what is law, what is justice, 
and what is the relationship between natural law and positive law, positive justice? What is the relationship, for instance, between what's happening to Ed Spanis and what's happening to Mark Greenberg huh? in relation to natural law? What is that? And this, this guy is beautiful, the Shakespeare. He named the two judges Mr. Justice Shallow and Mr. Justice Silence. <laughs> First thing he does. <laughs> and believe me, shallow is shallow. And <laughs> silence ought to be silent. You know? He also he, he deals with conscription. You know? When Falstaff is conscripting people to go fight. And you know the names he gives to the conscripts? I got a note here. Moldy. Shadow, what? Feeble, <laughs> bull calf. <laughs> now, why is he doing that? He's trying to teach you that nominalism is unimportant. Because the, the fellow with the most ridiculous name is the brave one. You know? So you can't judge by a name. Hmm? You can't say, if you're a Republican, I suppose, and I, uh, you don't want successor to Reagan to be Dole because his name is Dole. You don't want to see that. <laughs> <laughs> no, do you want to see him as be none because his name is none? <laughs> Whatever you wish to say about that, you know? <coughs> and he did, should you, how, how, on what basis do you conscript for an army? And is personal loyalty the best <coughs> method of getting allegiance? Or is financial reward? Or is it donatives, what you get afterwards? Because, you see, this is important. The Roman Empire ended up with a Praetorian guard encamped outside Rome. And that Praetorian guard decided Roman history, decided who would be emperor and who would not. And they worked for donatism. When things were bad, they, and you won't promise them something if you were made emperor, they get rid of the emperor and put you. At one stage, the Praetorian guard held up the imperial crown on auction. Yeah. Who know who bid, bid, bid for this crown? And there's somebody bid some merchant and he became emperor. <laughs> his name starts with a G. I can't remember what his name was. That's how bad it is. That's how bad it was. And you know Tigellanus and all those guys who kept Nero in power for their own purposes, you know. And kept Caligula around, and mad as a hatter, you know. But it serves a purpose. Because <laughs> the locus of power was in the Praetorian Guard. And any historical event you study, you have to study where is the locus of power. Unless you know the locus of power, you'll be like a Don Quixote tilting at windmills. Actually, not allegorically. <coughs> you know. You have to know that. Now, this is the feudal system. William the Conqueror in 1066 comes over from France, Normandy, fights the Battle of Hastings and Senac Hill and establishes in the end a feudal system. I own all the land. I'm the landlord. That's how you got the word landlord. No? And I divide the whole land. These are my tenants. Ten of you are barons and all okay. So you're my tenants. Then you have your tenants all the way down. And each tenant owes an obligation. If it's money, it's called either sockage or rent. Hence the word rent. That's why you pay rent. You know? Sometimes you have some nice terms. You have to provide two geese per year to the night. Mm -hmm. I've seen that. Or your <coughs> firstborn daughter must serve in the kitchen of the Lord. That, that happens. Things like that. If you were not in the feudal system for some reason, and you, you're outside the feudal manners and estates, you want to serve your village, hence the word village, meaning because they usually store. Now that's, that's a system where power existed in that form. The problem is, how do you centralize power when that happens? Because that's a system which presupposes the decentralization of power. And the impression you must or ought to be getting from these historical plays so far is that Shakespeare is attacking the feudal system, especially in the sense that it decentralizes power and prevents a strong nation. And it's not an ancient quarrel. It's, it exists today. Because surely if you stand back and look at American history in 1986, what is really happening is how strong should the states be? Should they be weak or strong? 
That has always been the argument here. Sure, Marshall and those guys believe in a strong central government. Sure, Reagan believes give more power to the states. But do you really, for you, I'm not going to give you my view, you really think you can be a superpower in a modern, dangerous age with decentralized power? <coughs> Where Idaho, you have to wait an opinion, some Idaho, <laughs> in Rhode Island? And, eh? You think you can do that? Because both these countries are, are, are federal states, you know. USSR is a federated state, 26 republics and 106 autonomous things. <coughs> And this is, a, this is a lot of states over here, too. You think you can really operate on a decentralized basis? Because that's the whole problem. Don't you need centralization in the face of danger? You really think you can exist in history by just diffusing power out? Hmm? Everybody's centralizing even the Europeans are trying to form an EEC, whether it's good or bad, it's not a matter. But then guys come here now with some 18th century philosophies <coughs> about state rights. <coughs> you know, about state rights. And, and a man sits down in the White House once, 1952 to 1960, you may not be aware of this, and decides that uh, an important thing like oil in America, whether he was going to grant California people the sole rights of exploiting California oil. You know. It's like Eisenhower did that. He had made an election promise. You know. <coughs> he made it so big. So this is what Shakespeare is dealing with here too. Look how this false stuff and the others are raising arms. You have to go and talk to the local macho man. Could you let me have a few of your people? Well, what do I get for this? Well, if you come up for a vote in Parliament, I'll vote for you or whatever. Do de to raise people. Do you think you can really raise, defend the country in the basis of rights? <coughs> what about the hypothesis he's saying? That you, you raise armies and defend the country in the basis of duty. For man is to say, I have a right. I don't want to go in the blasted army. You know, you're going to raise nothing. Don't you feel it's for you to think? I don't know. But we exaggerate rights, and the, the Russians exaggerate duty. <laughs> they go too far in the duty crap. But we go too far with rights. Because when the push comes to the shove, huh? you know, and it will come to the shove one of these days. You know what amuses me? Guys are asking for the individual rights to transfer arms if you kill children. And they want the. They speak about their individual rights. That, that's amusing to me. Because I don't understand this. I'll tell you one fact I know for sure. That if you increase the level of arms in any society, you increase the level of violence. You better believe it. Hey, if you're in your house and a burglar comes in, you got a baseball bat and a telephone, you work that. But if you know you got a revolver with six shots, you take it down. It's there. We were also being told something very arithmetically funny, that $30 million worth of arms is dropped in the bucket. They're kidding. <laughs> because I, I used to be a minister of trade, and I had to buy arms a couple of times, which you buy from Americans, but you don't buy from America. <laughs> These guys are smart. You want arms? You can get American arms. But they invent middlemen and, max and, and put it in this production as cost of it, you know, insurance free. And they take rake off there. If the middlemen cost a million, the middlemen are costing two million. That's extra profits they get. I tell you something worse. They sell you the guns without the bullets. And then, then hold you up to ransom for the bullets. All that I know. And then give you a cop and bull story that giving guns to Guyana uh, was not in the security interest of America. Because the statute says here, read the Federal Register. You can only sell arms if it's in the security interests of America. So the sale of arms to Iran had to have a certification by the <laughs> president that the sale of arms to Iran was in the security interests of America. The truth, of course, is that's a cover story. They decided. You know what the cover story is? In case you get caught, what you will say? You may with your girlfriend, but in case your wife asks, you mean to see a sister. <coughs> that's a cover story. 
no, if you're going to sell, you're going to sell arms to Romania. I mean, it's so stupid. It's, to me, the larger the events get, the more stupid they get and comical. <coughs> How are you going to sell two missiles and spare parts and you're not <coughs> selling Romania? You know? Anyway, the point is the cover stories. If we found out, we're going to say moderates. That was the cover story. Are we trying to get them because Russians are the boss? If we found out. But the, the, you guys are not trained to look for cover stories. So when the, my president, as they say, gets up and says, we were trying to open from find moderate, you believe it. That's the cover story. Well, you, you know the famous one in Grenada? We're going to rescue students. That was a cover story. The students were amazed that they were being rescued. <coughs> if we found out, that's what we would say. After all, you remember what happened in Carter with students? That was the cover story. The truth is North, I'm telling you what I know about. North went around. They needed something to happen to give the, they, they had to follow in policy failures, right? And he went around to those islands, Siaga and this woman Charles in Dominica. And he, uh, he drafted the letter that they would send to Reagan. And this is what they tell me here, you know. This is, I'm quoting them. So if you want to quote me, <coughs> quote me. And the idea was, they will send the letter to Reagan to intervene in Grenada. What helped them is, like the last straw, eh? cold and then won't kill Bishop. You know that. <laughs> Made easy. So Reagan's great foreign policy, and he beat Grenada. One more division, the island would have sunk. <laughs> <laughs> One more division, <laughs> the island would have sunk. But he beat them. 17 casualties, you know. <coughs> 17 American casualties. And they, they shot a, a madhouse. <laughs> there were a lot of lunatics in Grenada, and lunatics, you know, escaped and all that. And the very airstrip that he said was going to take Cuban military jets immediately took American military jets, you know. That kind of thing. You know this. I mean, well, that was the cover story. So Reagan will go down in history for his only foreign policy success. He conquered Grenada. <laughs> you want me to follow up the story? You know what the court did? This is how wicked this is. They just had a trial. A friend of mine was a prosecutor. Trinidadian homosexual. I know the guy. If he hears me, he's sick. He knows that. <laughs> <laughs> I know the guy. San Diego Martin in the Port of Spain area. Hudson Phillips is his name. Hyphenate. You know? Mm. <laughs> Black guy. Black guy. And um, 14 are to be hung. You hear what I'm telling you? 14 are to be hung. 20 are to get some food. 14 are to be hung, including Cord's wife. <coughs> no, you think? Rather. Well, you can't believe them. You think speaks, Larry speaks. Then we'll come and tell you guys what is happening in Grenada. That was the decision handed down two weeks ago. The hanging cord, who, who, they should hang for the what? Kill me for my bad verses, I think. He went to visit Fordham University, that's where he was. I suppose they're hanging him for that. His wife went to UWI and all that. But they're hanging them. Don't take my word when you go out tomorrow, ring and ask. Uh, ring, any, any newspaper. Because it was in the papers here. I got my news from the Times. <laughs> I cut it out. I know all these people. They're crazy. I don't agree with the political philosophy. But you can't go and tell people around the world you can have whatever government you want, provided it's one we want. You can't do that. You have to have other methods of encouraging them away from what they're doing. But not that method. Because you're going to make them more adamant to do. So when they hang Mrs. Cole, you, you wouldn't even hear. Some black woman in green, they hang. That's what you know. They know who orchestrated all of that? All of enough. And don't take my word, go and check the evidence.